Welcome to the channel if you've never been here before. This is Movie Readings, where I take entire Hollywood scripts and read them from start to finish. Sometimes these take hours to make, so it would really help me out if you could subscribe below and comment with which movies you would like to see in the near future. Of course, you can like or dislike, depending on how you feel about my choice for this video. Just so you know, the artist was suggested by one of the listeners on this channel, so if you have a suggestion, it's very probable that I will do it at some point in the future. Leave your comment below. Without further delay, The Artist, 2011. A silent film, illustrated musically, with some title cards to indicate the dialogues, with actors whose lips move when they speak, although we never actually hear their voices. The images are in black and white, in the format 1 by 1.33. The letters of the titles come up on a title card, typical in the 1920s. Elegant motifs around the edge of the frame and in the background are geometrical shapes reminiscent of the light beams of a film premiere. Behind is a stylized town. The titles end and fade to black. On black, the date appears on the screen, 1927. In a futuristic 1920s laboratory, a man in tailcoats and a bow tie is being tortured. Ultrasound is being piped into his ears. It's incredibly painful. He's screaming. I'm not telling. I won't talk. His torturers, cold men of science in white coats, gradually increase the volume. The pain seems unbearable. The volume reaches ten, a maximum and the man passes out. Guards wearing long leather overcoats throw the man into a cell. As the man is lying there on the ground, a dog wiggles through the bars at the window. The dog, a Jack Russell, jumps on top of the man, visibly his master, and begins to lick his face. The man opens one eye. When he sees his dog, he can't help but crack a smile. The man, now on his feet, looks in pain. Despite the pain, he motions to his dog, who begins to bark in lively fashion. Outside the cell, the guard looks curious about the noise. He goes to the door and opens the spy flap. He finds himself face to face with the man, eye to eye, just a couple of inches apart. The man moves his eyes in such a way that he hypnotizes the guard. Superimposed on the screen, a spinning black and white spiral, until the dazed guard takes his keys, opens the door, and releases the man and his dog. The man, and thus the hero, imprisons the guard without harming him, then runs over to the guard's desk. His ears are still causing him pain, but he opens a drawer and takes out his belongings, a top hat, which he snaps open, and a mask, which he puts over his head to conceal his eyes. We catch up with the masked man walking down corridors. He suddenly stops, copied by his dog, who follows him like his shadow. The man, on his guard, has spotted another guard where two corridors meet. With a look, he orders his dog to move forward into the guard's line of sight. The guard looks over at the animal. Using his fingers, the man pretends to shoot his dog. The dog collapses and plays dead. The guard, increasingly curious, gets to his feet. He slowly approaches the motionless dog. When he comes close, he is attacked from the side by the hero, who quickly puts him out of action with a mere punch. The masked man then rushes to another cell and releases a young female prisoner. She too is wearing evening dress. As she is thanking him, he staggers and clutches his ears in pain. She's concerned. Can I help you in some way? He refuses. No. I don't get helped. I give the help around here. He composes himself. She casts him an admiring glance, and then in view of the urgency of their situation, they escape at a run. They come out of a house that is lost in the hills, climb into a Bugatti sports car that the man starts by rubbing two wires together, and speed off. The car speeds along the road. Its occupants turn around to check they aren't being followed. 
The guard who got knocked out picks himself up, realizes what's happened, and dashes over to his office. He grabs a radio emitter and begins sending a message. The hero, the young woman and the dog, come to a halt in the Bugatti on the airfield by a telegraph pole whose wires lead to a watchtower. In the watchtower, a radio receptor is vibrating. A soldier approaches and listens. He suddenly understands. He grabs hold of his gun and goes out onto the airfield, only to find the fugitives. He tries to shoot at them as he draws closer, but the hero manages to throw an airplane propeller at him before climbing inside, where the woman and dog are waiting for him. The airplane begins to move. The soldier shoots. The airplane is positioning itself on the runway, while the soldier continues to fire. The aircraft gains speed. The soldier is still shooting, but too late, as the hero pulls back the joystick and the airplane takes to the sky. The soldier is furious, but the hero is all smiles, as he looks back towards the ground and shouts something. Free Georgia forever! The airplane flies away into the evening sky. A little later in the night, still at the controls, the man is fighting not to fall asleep. Behind him, the woman is sleeping. The dog is lying in her arms. Suddenly, she is awoken by explosions happening close by. Pandemonium. The man doesn't understand it either. He tries to pick up altitude, but quickly notices that the explosions are in fact pretty and inoffensive. He consults a calendar dial on the control panel that shows it is July 14th, immediately understanding, and they burst out into laughter. We've arrived! Welcome to France. As the music picks up in the tune of the Marseillaise, the airplane flies away through the exploding fireworks. The words, the end, appear on the screen. From the moment they parked the car onwards, we become absorbed by what's happening around the screen at the end of this film. Behind the screen, we've seen the actor who plays the hero. His name is George Valentin, closely studying the reactions of the audience. He was standing close to his dog, motioning to him to not make a noise. The dog's name is Jack. In the same area, we've also seen the lead actress. Her name is Constance Gray. She too looks tense and is latched onto the arm of a pleasant-looking man who is chewing anxiously on a cigar. The man looks rich, but a little weak. He is surely the producer. In the theater, much of the audience is open-mouthed and excited, immobile, and often wide-eyed. In the pit, a symphony orchestra plays to accompany the film. Now that the film is ending, the last note is sounding, the cast anxiously awaits the audience's verdict, which, after two or three seconds of silence, burst into thunderous applause, to the great joy of the actors and the people around him, especially the actress and the producer, who kiss each other on the lips. Two theater hands bring down the curtain. The lights come on. George Valentin comes onto the stage and acknowledges the audience. They are cheering for him. He is so happy he dances a few tap steps to express his joy. Then he acknowledges the orchestra, before finally motioning to someone in the wings to join him. Jack, the dog, trots over in response. The crowd laughs and cheers. George waves to the dog. Jack waves back, and then waves at the audience. The people are loving it. In the wings, Constance is fuming with rage, but on stage... George is pretending with his fingers to pull at the dog, who fakes death. Thunderous applause again. Behind the actress, the producer can't hold back a smile. This enrages the actress still more. Suddenly, George, hamming it up, remembers something he'd forgotten, and asks someone from the other side of the wings to join him. It's Constance. She comes over, smiling to the audience, and says something to George with a smile. I'll get you for that. She waves, but we can tell that her smile is set between her teeth. She isn't feeling comfortable. George motions, firing a gun with his fingers, but she does not fall down. She casts him a very funny glance. 
George looks at his fingers, not understanding why they didn't work anymore. He then mimes throwing them away, as though they had become useless. Constance stalks back off into the wings with annoyance, but the audience is ecstatic. Once in the wings, the actress sticks up her middle finger at George and exaggeratedly mouths so we can read her lips. Put this up your ass. George, grinning broadly, responds by clapping his hands in applause and then leaves the stage, executing a few more dance steps as he does so. The audience is delighted. As he comes off the stage, George gets soundedly told off by Constance, but still grinning, he motions toward the audience, who are still asking for more. The producer, although delighted by the successful reception, makes a weak attempt to calm the actress down. As for George, he returns to the stage, and the audience roars. He pretends to want to leave the stage, and mimes bumping into an invisible wall, just as he's leaving. George holds his nose, and the audience goes wild. Constance gets madder, and while George carries on clowning about, the producer too breaks into a beaming smile. He's probably realized that George has the audience on his side. Constance, furious, storms off. She is followed by the producer, who is trying to placate her, although it seems like he's got his work cut out for him. Outside, we are in front of a typically American movie theater decked out with all the accessories of a grand premiere. The entrance is lit up. There are crowds gathered on the sidewalk. Cops are guarding the red carpet with a cordon of bodies, etc. George comes out, causing the crowds, mainly young women, to press forwards, and the photographers flash to spark to life. The cops are struggling to maintain control of the situation as George poses for the photographers and waves at his many fans. In the crowd, a young woman right at the front is staring at him in rapture. She drops her bag, and as she bends to pick it up, a swell in the crowd pushes her underneath the arms of the policeman in front of her, out of the crowd, and into George. She stares at him, more in love than ever, delighted to be there. The police wait for someone to give orders. George doesn't quite know what to do. Nobody moves. The young woman finally bursts out laughing, which, after a moment of shock, causes George to laugh too thus placating the cops and tacitly signaling to the photographers that they can take pictures of the scene. The flashes seem to lend the woman self-confidence, who, in a very carefree manner, begins to clown about in front of them. George is delighted by the sight, by the whole scene. Realizing this, the young woman steals a kiss. Flash. The image becomes static, and then dissolves into a printed picture. This is the front page of the Hollywood Reporter newspaper, along with three other pictures of the scene and the headline, Who is that girl? The very same newspaper is being read by an elegant woman sitting at a sumptuous breakfast table. We are in the large dining room of an ultra-luxurious Hollywood villa. All around her are magnificent furniture, superb paintings, and objets d'art, including a beautiful trio of monkeys one hiding its eyes, one with hands clasped to its ears, and the third obscuring its mouth. George comes into the room and kisses his wife. She responds with cold indifference. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. The woman hands George the newspaper. He knows what's up, but tries to laugh it off. She doesn't find it funny. She's as cold as stone and barely looks at him. She is obviously extremely annoyed with him. George picks up his dog and puts it on the table. Jack drops his head to one side. His eyes seem to implore forgiveness. It's the exact expression of someone asking to be loved, but Doris is implacable. She gets up and walks away and does not turn back. Left on his own, George has a closed expression on his face. He seems unhappy to have hurt his wife's feelings, then he realizes that Jack is on the table in a ridiculous pose and signals to him to get down. The dog obeys. George looks at the paper, the cause of his problems. 
we cut to 13 white letters placed on a hillside. Hollywood Land. Below, in town, a bus. Inside the full bus is the young woman from the day before. Her name is Peppy Miller. She is proudly holding the Hollywood Reporter with her face on the front page and is more or less discreetly making suggestive glances, hoping that someone recognizes her. But the people around her, from working to middle-class backgrounds, are visibly on their way to work and remain impervious to her game. She carefully puts the paper away in her bag, in which four or five copies of the newspaper are already tucked away. Then she gets off the bus at the next stop. She goes through the main gates of Kinograph Studios and heads towards where they hire extras. In a courtyard, fifty-odd people are waiting, some sitting on wooden crates, others sitting. There are mums with kids, guys with animals, men dressed as cowboys, etc. Peppy is among them, sitting next to a man of about sixty. He is dressed in highly stylized fashion. His job is obviously that of a butler. Peppy proudly shows him the picture of the newspaper. The man leans in to take a closer look, unfolds the newspaper, sees the headline, smiles, then folds it back up, returns it to Peppy, text side up, highlighting the headline, Who's that girl? Peppy is a bit annoyed to have been put in her place, but deep down she knows he's right. Nobody knows who she is. She puts the newspaper away. A man who has visibly worked for the studio, some assistant or other, comes into the courtyard, climbs onto a crate, and makes an announcement. Contemporary film. Five girls who can dance. All the men who had pressed forward turn on their heels, leaving the assistant surrounded by only women. The man says something to one girl who begins to dance. He motions to her that it's okay, and she heads off towards the wardrobe section. He does the same with the second girl. She gets hired too. Then, it's Peppy's turn. She puts a lot of energy into a few top-class tap steps, impressing the guy to such an extent that he smiles admiringly, then signals that she's hired. Full of self-assurance that her lucky day has come, Peppy heads off towards wardrobe, swinging her hips as she pauses in front of the butler. The name is Miller. Peppy Miller. She finishes with an exaggerated wink before walking on, leaving behind the impassive butler. In the lobby of George and Doris's house, George is preparing to leave. He waves at the huge full-length portrait of himself waving and smiling whilst wearing a tuxedo. He looks great in the painting. George is delighted to see and wave at himself. Later, George, in a luxurious car driven by his chauffeur, arrives at the studio with his dog. The guard at the entrance smiles broadly at them and waves. As he walks towards his dressing room, everyone smiles at him. He's not always fooled by these signs of respect, and apes a few smiles himself. In his dressing room, wearing a tailcoat and a top hat, George is finishing putting his makeup on. He has a white face and dark lips and eyes. His chauffeur is signing autographs for him on full-length photographs of himself with his dog. George says to himself, Go and buy a piece of jewelry for my wife. A nice piece to make it up to her. The chauffeur nods. Having finished his mask up, George picks up a photo and looks at it closely. Then he writes on it. As he leaves the dressing room, we see the photograph. He has written Woof Woof on it and signed it with a paw print of a dog. We're on a film set, and the crew is setting up a shot. The director is unhappy with a screen positioned behind a bay window, and he sends it off. Remove the screen, and bring me another one. On the double. Two hands pick up the screen and carry it away. George arrives on set. Everyone smiles at him. He sits down on the chair, which bears his name. The producer whom we saw the previous day at the premiere arrives. His name is Zimmer, and he's flanked by and followed around at every moment by two secretaries and two assistants. One of them hands him the Hollywood Reporter. Zimmer, 
Before he's even come to a halt, he talks to George as he shows him the front page. He is visibly upset. George looks a lot more relaxed. He says hello and vaguely tries to reassure him, but Zimmer persists, still pointing at the newspaper. Because of this childish nonsense, there's nothing about the film before page five. Behind George, the two set hands come back with a new screen of sky scenery and wait, standing just next to George. As they are holding it, there is a three-foot gap underneath. While the producer is talking to him, George's attention is drawn by a lovely pair of women's legs that have come to stand behind the screen, the top half of the body being hidden behind it. George acknowledges the sight with a smile, and is about to bring his attention back to the conversation when his attention is drawn away by a noise, a few tap steps of the female legs, presumably as a warm-up. George smiles in recognition and responds with a few tap steps of his own. The woman's legs instantly stop, and they seem to think of a moment and then answer back. With a jump in the complexity of the steps, a tap dialogue ensues between the two pairs of legs until the set hands, the path before them now cleared, pick up their screen of scenery and walk off with it. The screen moves away as it disappears, revealing that the upper body belongs to a young woman. She pulls a face meaning, here I am, and of course it's Peppy, except that she immediately realizes who she is dealing with. Visibly, she wasn't expecting this at all and feels completely ridiculous and uncomfortable. Her joyful expression gradually becomes one of abject apology, but George is roaring with laughter. After a short pause, Zimmer makes the connection. He checks the front page and recognizes her. Then he begins shouting at her. All she can do is lower her head, unable to reply. He gestures that she's fired, for her to get out. She starts to go, completely distraught. She's just made a couple of steps when George stops her and tells her to come back. Everyone is surprised, most of all him. Zimmer can't believe it, and so he doesn't respond at first. There's a bad feeling between them, as though we'd never wanted this sudden conflict, but like it had always been there, tangible. Everyone on the set seems to be waiting for Zimmer to react, but to their surprise, after a long moment of hesitation, he walks away without saying a thing. Peppy looks at George gratefully, smiling, but seems a little preoccupied, as though she might have made a mistake. Everyone on set gets back to work. They're about to start shooting. The director is showing George what he has to do. The scene is happening in a cabaret restaurant. George has to cross a dance floor, but each time he is stopped by a guy ringing a bell to signal it is time to change dancing partner. George finds himself dancing with Peppy one moment, in the arms of a very fat man the next. The director finds the gag hysterical. The scene is shot several times from three different angles. Each time, George dances with Peppy, and each time, the nature of their rapport changes. To begin, they are happy and laughing, but with time, less so. Then they become embarrassed, then things get worse. We start the sequence again and again, to the sound of the clapperboard counting the number of takes, but the eroticism between them is the only thing that stands out from the scene. Everything else goes unnoticed. Ultimately, no flirting or suggestiveness has gone on, just the very obvious beginnings of feelings between them that they find disturbing. It's probably love. Later on, in the dressing room corridor, Peppy, holding an envelope, goes up to George's door. She knocks and waits for a reply, and then enters. Nobody is there. She hesitates, not sure whether to leave or stay. Finally, she goes into the room and places the envelope addressed to George Valentin on the dresser. Then, she attentively looks around the dressing room. She looks at the objects and photos, and notices hanging from a coat stand George's jacket on a hanger. His hat sits on a hook above it. The way the clothes are disposed looks like George's silhouette, except the clothes are empty. She looks over and strokes the jacket. Little by little, she brings George to life through his clothes. 
She puts her right hand into the sleeve and touches her own waist. As it's George's sleeve, she makes it look like his arm has come to life, as though George has come to life, even more so since her left hand is stroking the jacket, as though George were inside. She takes pleasure from the embrace. Then, when George comes into the room, she slowly removes her hand without any rush. George sees her, and they look at each other. He closes the door but doesn't go over to her, instead goes over to the mirror. He looks at her. She looks at him. He motions to her to approach. She does. He stares at her face for a while before he speaks. If you want to be an actress, you need to have something that no one else has. He takes up a makeup pencil and draws a beauty spot above her upper lip. She looks at herself in the mirror and smiles. She likes it. She turns towards him and quite naturally folds into his arms. The dog watches them curiously with its head leaning to one side. They are probably about to kiss when George's chauffeur comes into the room and catches them. George swiftly moves aside. There is a moment of discomfort. The chauffeur unwraps a parcel, takes out a large and beautiful pearl necklace. George is intrigued by the necklace and turns away from Peppy. She understands that George has his own life, that their embrace was just a stolen moment, and slowly leaves. Looking back at George as she does so, he does not look at her. She leaves the room. Once he has studied the necklace and is satisfied, George turns back towards Peppy, but she is no longer there. The chauffeur exits the room. When he is alone, George looks at himself in the mirror. His expression shows that he thinks he is the stupidest man in the world. He mimes shooting himself in the temple with his fingers, but it's the dog who collapses into its play-dead pose. The next morning, he's having breakfast with his wife. The atmosphere is still dreadful, but this time he's not making any effort either. He's disdainfully watching Doris eat. She is cutting up strawberries using a knife and fork. George watches her, smiles, and continues to watch. Except it's not Doris he is watching. Instead, it's Peppy, who's tucking into her food and laughing and laughing vivaciously. George is with her, with an expression of love on his face. He is laughing with her, when suddenly reality bites. He's still sitting opposite Doris. She's staring at him because she doesn't understand why he is laughing. She visibly finds him ridiculous. He stops laughing, and breakfast carries on as normal. We see several quick sequences which indicate time passing. Breakfasts with George and Doris where the atmosphere is increasingly dreadful. Doris scribbles on photos of George in the press, draws on mustaches, large spectacles, etc., short extracts of George in various films, in which he portrays a pirate, then a cowboy, then William Tell, etc. We also see him in Someday in July, in the sequence he shot with Peppy and the fat male dancer. We see moviegoers reacting to the films, but the way the images are edited, cut with breakfast images, could mean they are reacting to them, too. Among the audience is Peppy Miller. She's trying to concentrate fully on the film and is pushing away the handsome young man she's with, who is trying to kiss her. We see her later at the movies, but this time alone. We see her playing some bit parts, maid, dancer. Her roles seem to get a lot bigger. We notice now that she has the beauty spot, and she'll keep it forever. Her name climbs up in the ranks in the title sequences of films until it appears all on its own. We see her signing a contract in a small office. She seems happy. George signs a big contract with Zimmer. As photographers take pictures, he smiles broadly, whereas Zimmer looks like his smile is a little forced. The date appears on the screen, 1929. George, dressed as a musketeer, is sword fighting with three Middle Ages thugs in a tavern. He kills two of them, but unfortunately loses his épée 
when fighting the third. When the third man attacks, George merely dodges with a slight of the body and puts his attacker out of action with a right hook. Calm restored, he smiles and waves in brotherly fashion to a mysterious man who is trying to hide underneath his long cape. The man stands up, throws aside his cape, and reveals himself to be Napoleon. He pulls out his bicorn hat and warmly thanks an astonished George. Napoleon says something to him, and George respectfully bows. He walks away from him, still bowing, then turns and runs. Once out of the decor, he bumps right into the worried-looking Zimmer, who is followed by his loyal assistants. George is in a playful mood. Zimmer tells him, I want to show you something, right now. George seems astonished that Zimmer is leaving the set and not filming, but agrees. Napoleon walks past them very imperially and gestures royally to a technician to bring him a chair. The technician doesn't miss the chance to remind the man he is only an extra and not really Napoleon. Zimmer, his guards, and George, still dressed as a musketeer, come into a screening room in which a dozen or so very serious-looking people are waiting. They sit down, and Zimmer, very proudly and self-confidently, gestures to an assistant who passes on the message to a projectionist. The room goes dark. The screening begins. On screen we see a card that indicates it's a sound shooting test for a talking scene. Then, Constance appears. The actress from the spy film. She's standing in front of a mic, and she tests it, delighted to be there. Cut. We see her again. The microphone has disappeared, and she acts out a scene. It's a monologue. Her acting is terrible, very theatrical, but the audience can hear her. It is, however, awful. In the screening room, the audience seems stunned by what they see and hear. They are fascinated. They then begin to congratulate each other and slap Zimmer on the back. Zimmer's pride seems to grow by the second. George, who at first seems very surprised, slowly begins a snigger, which gradually has become a belly laugh when the actress earnestly ends her monologue. When the lights come up, George is laughing uncontrollably, way beyond the bounds of mere mockery, as his sincerity is obvious. The people present are embarrassed, and Zimmer is deeply put out. George, still laughing, leaves the room, waving an apology with his hands as he goes, but also pointing to the screen to explain why he's laughing. Zimmer feels even more humiliated. We fade to black on his face. We are back now with George in his dressing room. He's removing his makeup. He moves some ordinary object, and the object, as he moves it, makes a noise. We hear the noise it makes. Really hear it. It's the first time we've heard a noise that comes from within the film itself. One second later, George realizes that the object made a noise. He moves it again. The object makes a noise again. George is a little worried. He tries another object, and it makes a noise. His dog barks, and we hear it. He gets up, the chair making a noise, and says something to his dog, but no sound comes out of his mouth when he speaks. He realizes this. Panic sets in. He turns to the mirror and tries talking again, but still no sound comes out. Not understanding what's happening, the feeling of panic fully blossoms. He flees the dressing room. Noisy, laughing dancers pass in the corridor. Others are talking or shouting. Even if we can't make out what they are saying, they are making sound. George tries to talk to them, but his voice remains silent. One dancer seeing his fright, bursts into throaty laughter. George rushes in through the milling crowd, the sound of which is becoming increasingly loud. He bursts out into the courtyard of the studio that is now suddenly deserted and silent. In front of him, a feather eddies slowly to the ground, carried by the breeze. It finally lands, making a completely abnormal and disproportionate noise, 
like that of a building crashing to the ground in slow motion. George screams, but again his cry is silent. George awakes with a start. He's in bed and is having trouble shaking off his nightmare. The film continues as normal, in other words, silent. His wife is sleeping by his side. He gets up, taking care not to make a sound. George calms down as he sits in the living room, alone in the darkness. Jack, still sleepy, has just curled into a ball next to him to fall back to sleep. George smiles and gives him a pat. Driven by his chauffeur, George crosses town, heading for the studios. The car goes through the studio gates. George gets out. Nobody is there. He goes into the courtyard. Nobody there, either. He goes into the studio and heads for the set. There's still no one about. He doesn't understand and goes back outside. Outside, in the deserted courtyard, a feather eddies toward the ground. Carried by the breeze, George is watching it drift to the ground when suddenly a gust of wind sends it soaring back into the sky. George follows it with his eyes, and notices a man crossing between two sets. He looks like some kind of set hand or assistant, a working man in any case. George calls to him. The two men draw close, and George asks him what's happening. The man takes the day's newspaper out of his pocket and hands it to George before walking off. George reads, Kinograph Studios stop all silent productions to work exclusively on talkies. Despite the secretary's attempts to stop him, a furious George storms into Zimmer's office. Zimmer is in a meeting with some men. They are probably engineers, in view of the attention being given to the plans lying on the desk. Everyone is surprised by George's rude entry. The engineers seem embarrassed, but Zimmer smiles and politely asks them to leave, as though asking for their understanding. As they head for the door, some of them drop their heads so as to not meet George's eyes, whereas others look right at him between the eyes without any love lost. This exchange causes a strange, unpleasant feeling within him. He seems embarrassed. It's perhaps due to the rudeness of his eruption into the office, but it's more likely due to the looks he's been given. For the first time in ages, he has not been looked at how a star is normally looked at, with respect desire, admiration, but like any ordinary man is looked at, or worse, how a superfluous man is looked at. As George realizes that his status has changed, Zimmer invites him to sit down, then speaks to him in a friendly manner. We belong to another age, you and I, George. Nowadays, the world talks. He talks to him and looks a little embarrassed, while George takes it on the chin not knowing how to respond. People want to see new faces, talking faces. George reaches deep down into himself and makes an effort to bring up a smile. Paramount will be delighted. They still want me. Zimmer responds with a pursing of the lips that is more damning than any counter-argument could be. As though he's telling George he can always give it a go, George understands what's happening. Zimmer is sorry. I'm sorry. The public wants fresh blood, and the public is never wrong. George gets to his feet. It's me the people want. It's my films they want to see, and I'm going to give them to them. Zimmer nods with another pursing of the lips, as though he can't wait to see it. George seems very sure of himself. I don't need you. Go make your talking movies. I'm going to make them a beautiful film. As George leaves in disgust, his eyes are drawn to an advertising feature representing the new faces of Kinograph Studios. Among the medallion-framed young portraits, George recognizes that of Peppy Miller. He glances up at Zimmer. Fresh blood. The two men exchange a last glance. Then George exits. Outside, he feels a few seconds of discouragement. 
but as he meets the gaze of the engineers waiting in the secretary's antechamber, he puffs up his chest and walks tall out of the office. Going down the stairs from the offices, he passes a laughing Peppy, who is accompanied by two young and charming men, perfect specimens of America's golden youth. She is coming up, he is going down. When she notices him, she stops, already one step above him. She has a beaming smile and is truly delighted to see him. He is delighted too, although his mood is very different. How are you? Fantastic! I've been given a lead role. Isn't it wonderful? He nods. We see in his eyes that he's terribly happy for her. They look at each other. She laughs. Then she fumbles in her bag for something with which to note her phone number on a piece of paper. It takes a while and is a little chaotic. She apologizes, but he visibly takes a lot of pleasure out of watching her. She finally gets the number down and hands it to him, telling him to call her, to really call her. In response, he casts a glance over to the young men waiting for her up the stairs. She bursts out laughing. She leans towards him to say something. Gadgets. She looks at him flirtatiously. Then, she gestures again for him to call her. He nods, even though we think that he probably will not do so. She leaves. He watches her go before beginning his descent once more. Once at the top, she turns back to call out to George, but he too has turned to look. She smiles, breaks into a few tap steps, for old time's sake, then blows him a kiss. He catches the kiss with a smile, pretends to make it disappear into his other hand like a magician, and then shows her the inside breast pocket of his jacket as proof that he's keeping it safe and warm. She laughs loudly and goes on her way. He watches her walk away with admiration in his eyes. She vanishes, and George's smile takes on a note of melancholy. Then he leaves, too. George comes home. Doris is there, scribbling on a magazine, but he takes no notice of her. The dog jumps into his arms. However, he greets it affectionately. Doris is vexed. A moment later, he's running Jack through his tricks when Doris arrives. We have to talk, George. George smiles. Or not. She insists, but he doesn't listen. He's with his dog. She gets annoyed. He doesn't answer. She ends up throwing Jack. George cannot forgive her for doing so. He looks at her in disgust. She starts to cry. I'm unhappy, George. He answers without looking at her. So are millions of other people. Me, for instance. Thanks to a montage of shot frames, photos, and press cuttings, we see George begin making his film the first clap of the board that shows he's both the film's producer and director. The film is called Tears of Love and tells the tale of an English adventurer, played by himself, accompanied by a young woman, an old man who looks like a professor and who is probably the father of the young woman, and lastly, an African tribe represented as savages and whose humanity remains to be proven. We see George in the various stages of preparation. Writing, rewriting, directing, acting, signing a lot of checks, but also leaving very early in the morning to set up shots with his collaborators, etc. He looks fulfilled, like he truly believes in what he's doing, despite the tiredness he's feeling. His dog has a role in the film, too, doing tricks. George looks very happy and very committed, he takes a supple branch and feeds it through the sleeves of the woman's blouse. By holding the two ends of the branch out in front of him, he dances with the imaginary woman. Everyone around him is happy and laughing. He is not shooting a comedy, however. It is obviously a drama of some sort, from what we see of the set and the way the actors play their roles. Then appear on the screen the mock-ups of posters. They are shown on the set to George. He chooses the one which is most prominent. It's a poster depicting a cutesy melodrama 
and bears the release date October 25th. In the street, at the entrance to a movie theater, George sees a large beauty spot film poster. The poster shows Peppy close up, wearing a magnificent and jauntily positioned chapka over one eye. She is incredibly stylish, but in no way vampish. More the image of a young comedy debut. George looks at her. Peppy seems to be smiling at him. He smiles back. Then his smile becomes strained. He has noticed something. The two theater employees are sticking a banner over the poster that reveals the release date of Beauty Spot. is also October 25th. Then we see advertising inserts and full-page press articles appearing one after the other, creating a montage of images with a very 1920s feel. Get some peps with Peppy. Close up on her smiling, mischievous face. The girl next door. The girl you'll love to love. Young and pretty. Etc. With a photo of Peppy each time, posters of the film, and then everywhere. The fact that it's a talking movie. Talking, talking, talking. As for George, his image is a lot more austere. The photographs show him as very serious. The captions are like, I'm not a Muppet anymore. I'm an artist. We're in a smart restaurant. George has his back to the room and is eating with his chauffeur. Peppy comes into the restaurant, comes to sit just behind George. They are back to back. She is with several young men, two of whom are journalists that are interviewing her. Your first film doesn't come out until tomorrow, and yet you're already the new darling of Hollywood. How do you explain that? She starts by bursting into laughter, which draws George's attention. He turns around to listen to the rest of Peppy's answer. I don't know. Maybe it's because I talk, and people hear me. She continues talking, obviously happy that people are interested in her. She doesn't see George smiling behind her. People are sick to death of those old actors who pull faces to make themselves understood. She continues talking with the casual arrogance of youth. Behind her, George's smile vanishes. Anyway, it's normal for the young to take over from the old. That's life. Make way for the youth. George is hurt. He gets up, but before he leaves, he gestures silently that if she wants his place, all she has to do is take it. She watches him leave and immediately regrets what she has just said. It's the day of the film's release, October 25th. In the morning, George opens his front door. His chauffeur is outside. The man's expression announces bad news. He's holding the day's press. The huge headlines talk of a stock market crash, a Black Thursday, catastrophe. Dressed in a robe, George is on the telephone in the living room. He nods. The atmosphere is stifling. He hangs up. His chauffeur looks at him inquisitively. George replies, as though lost in thought. It would seem that we're ruined. The chauffeur takes it on the chin, with as much reserve as he can muster, but George continues. That's the best case scenario. He almost laughs. Not so the chauffeur. Now wearing a suit, George is sitting at his desk. Lying in front of him are the front pages of newspapers reporting the crash. He looks for something on the inside pages of one paper and reads. Next to a large picture of Peppy, there is a review of his own film, beginning, Tears of Love, Old and Boring. He shuts the paper and searches for something in the drawer of his desk. He takes out a piece of paper. It's the telephone number that Peppy had scribbled down for him. He looks at it, moves closer to the phone, hesitates, looks at the paper again, and then puts the scrap of paper back in the drawer without making the call. Peppy awakes in bed with a start. She doesn't know what has woken her up. She looks around, looks at the phone, and seems perplexed. When a man's arm invites her to lie back down, she does. Still at his desk, George gets up and goes to the window. 
he seems lost in thought. An extract from Tears of Love, in which we see George holding the young woman in his arm, take part in a cliched African dance with shields and spears and all the African accoutrements attributed by Westerners at the time. George and the woman are complacently watching the dance when George says to the young woman, Let's go back, Norma. They've never seen a white woman before, and I don't want to take any risks. There's hardly anyone in the theater. The people that are there look bored more than anything. At the back, smoking a cigarette, George takes the failure on the chin. One couple gets to their feet and leaves the theater. As the man reaches George, he recognizes him and casts him a glance that seems to say, Goodness, old chap, this one's not up to much. George doesn't know what to say in reply. Outside, George comes out still smoking his cigarette. On the sidewalk, people are cheerfully waiting in line. George walks up to the line and comes to the movie house that's playing Beauty Spot, the talking movie. A huge poster depicts Peppy, and the people in line seem excited and delighted to be going to see the film. It's visibly a success. George takes it on the chin. Inside the car, behind the implacable chauffeur, George is talking to himself, as though he's rerunning the story in his head and searching for what he might have done better or differently. Once home, he finds a photo of himself on the floor. It has been defaced with a scribbled mustache, spectacles, and a big nose. There's a note to him scribbled on the back. We read it at the same time as him. It's over, George. You've got a fortnight to collect your souvenirs together and get out of the house. P.S. You should go see Beauty Spot. It's incredible. George takes it on the chin and leaves, revealing behind him the portrait of himself wearing a tuxedo, smiling and waving. As for Peppy, she's in the theater watching Tears of Love. She's with a handsome young man who seems bored. George is wearing shorts and an explorer's hat. He is sinking in sinking sand. The young woman is screaming and the dog is barking. The Africans are panicking, but there's nothing anyone can do. George stops struggling and looks deep into the eyes of the young woman. He says gently, Farewell, Norma. I never loved you. It's obvious he's only saying that so that she can forget him and move on with her life, but it doesn't wash, and the young woman weeps all the more, terribly moved by this last sacrifice on his part. In the balcony, Peppy is speechless and her face impassive. On screen, George and the young woman exchange a last glance as George's face gradually sinks into the sand. Next to Peppy, the young man sits watching her. She seems sad. On screen, George has disappeared into the mire. Only one hand stays in the air for several seconds more in a tortured pose, that of a dying man trying to hold on to the wind. Peppy's companion seems to find the film far too long and doesn't understand why they haven't already left. The hand has disappeared. The young woman is in a state of shock, rigid with a look of horror on her face. She is no doubt about to be put to certain death. The dog turns around and walks off with his head and tail lowered. The end appears on the screen. Peppy seems moved. She is shaking her head from side to side. Evening has fallen on the town. It's raining. On the ground lies an old page from a newspaper that bears a picture of George. A man's feet trample the picture. George is now at home. Two bottles are apparent, and obviously drunk, he is staring out the window. The projection of raindrops sliding down the window looks like tears running down his face. Jack's face, too. George is pulled out of his stupor as he hears something. He opens the door. It's Peppy. She immediately notices that George is drunk. Her smile tenses a little. I wanted to talk. I... George looks at her. She continues. I saw tears of love. George nods and answers. And so you've come to get your money back. 
She smiles stiffly, not knowing how to react. He continues. Too much face pulling? She stops smiling because it's not funny at all. It's bitter. There's an embarrassed silence. Softly, she tries to explain. About last night. She stops because George is not looking at her anymore. He's watching the arrival of the young, smiling, handsome, and wholesome man who is with Poppy. George bears a melancholy smile. You're right. Make way for the youth. The young man shakes George's hand. He's obviously a nice lad and very polite. I'm so happy to meet you. My dad just loves you. He says it very nicely, with no ulterior motive, but George is cut to the quick. The comment wounds him, and Peppy notices. She cuts short the meeting by smiling and upping the cheerfulness stakes, as though to kid George. She hasn't noticed any embarrassment or perceived anything that might have shocked or hurt him during the encounter. Okay, well, we'll be off now. I'll call you soon. Bye! George smiles politely. She leaves, taking the handsome jock with her. George watches them leave, as does his dog, who sits with his head and ears hanging low, as though very disappointed. George watches Peppy walking away, and then steps forward and sits down on the steps leading up to the house. As she gets into the car, Peppy seems surly, unhappy even, for the first time. She turns back to her companion. Take me home. I'd like to be alone. George watches the car leave and then goes and sits on a bench next to the front door. But the bench breaks and George finds himself on the ground next to the dog. George remarks evenly to Jack. See? Could be it just wasn't my day. We fade to black. In the rain, a worker is taking down letters from the facade of the theater. Tears of love. Only the word tears remain. Peppy is facing her mirror and putting her makeup on. She takes a break, looking a little sad. Someone, some kind of assistant, opens the door to her dressing room and says something like, You need to hurry up. She nods and gets back to work. Alternate shots of three or four film posters and frames, which illustrate Peppy's rising fame. Her name moves higher up the posters, into big letters. The films are called The Rookie, The Brunette, The Girl Next Door, and On the Roof. We catch up with Peppy in a close-up, applying her makeup. The camera pulls back, and we see that not only is she not putting the makeup on herself, a makeup artist is doing it, but there are in fact four pairs of hands getting busy around her. Two makeup girls, a hairdresser, and a wardrobe assistant. Peppy, fortunately, has stayed completely natural and doesn't seem to take any of it seriously. As the last touch is put in place, Peppy gets to her feet and turns around. At her feet lie a dozen pairs of shoes, each pair as magnificent as the next, and all in their swanky boxes. Peppy tries on a pair, close up of her feet. We crossfade to a man's pair of shoes with used heels and uppers. George's dog comes to sit at his feet. The date is superimposed on the screen, 1931. The camera climbs up his leg. He's changed. And even if his suit is still pretty smart, he has become more common and less unattainable. He seems to have lost whatever it is that made him so superb. Primarily, he's a bit drunk and somewhat hesitant. George gets up and closes his Murphy bed, the kind of bed that slots up into the wall to look like a closet. Then he walks across the living area. His home has changed too. It has fallen in class, and it is a lot more modest than the one we're used to seeing him in, we do recognize some of the objects, furniture, and paintings from his old house, notably the huge portrait of him smiling. He goes into the kitchen, which is open onto the rest of the apartment. There's nothing in the refrigerator. He looks for something to drink, but there's only one bottle left in the rack. He lifts it up. It's empty. He opens a closet. Inside, 
a tuxedo, hangs among a number of bare hangers. Now in a pawn shop, George, still a little drunk, is selling his tuxedo. The pawnbroker and he are visibly disagreeing on the price, but of course, it's George who folds first and hands over the tuxedo. The pawnbroker counts out the bills and hands them to George, who in a fit of pride leaves a tip as he leaves, his dignity intact even in the face of adversity. At home, George is drinking and watching his chauffeur fix some food. He seems preoccupied. How long has it been since I paid you last, Clifton? The chauffeur answers as he carries on doing what he's doing. It's been one year now, sir. George gets up, visibly thinking that he shouldn't have done that, that it's wrong. He goes and gets the keys and a jacket. He comes back and gives them to the chauffeur. You're fired. Keep the car. Get yourself a job someplace else. The chauffeur refuses. George insists. They don't agree, but George ends up throwing him out, even though we've understood that he's doing it for Clifton's benefit and not through any unkindness. Once outside, the chauffeur doesn't move. He stays next to the car. George watches him through the window. The chauffeur still doesn't budge. George pulls the curtain. In the evening, George looks out between the curtains. The chauffeur is still there. George turns on his heels and gets into his Murphy bed. Nighttime. George is in bed with his eyes open. Outside, the chauffeur is still in the same position. The next morning, George gets up and goes to look from the window. The chauffeur has gone. George is a little sad, but it's just the way it is. He looks around his home. A little later, George looks at himself in the mirror. We pass from him to his reflection, which he hides by placing his drink against the mirror. A sign says that the effects of George Valentin are to be auctioned. Furniture, costumes, objets d'art, and paintings on September 14th. There aren't many people in the room, just five or six. George is standing at the back, smoking a cigarette. His position and demeanor are exactly like when he was watching the screening of Tears of Love from the back of the room, with the verdict of failure in the air. He's looking a little unsteady on his feet, probably due to the hip flask he's necking that seems to contain liquor. The objects go under the hammer one by one. We see the three monkeys go by, notably, Hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. Two buyers especially are raising the prices by bidding against each other. A distinguished and reserved looking man, and a lady of a certain age, who looks a bit severe, to the point of bigotry. They don't seem perfectly comfortable, but they are the only two buying. A few crossfades. The display table emptying, faces, hands being raised, the hammer falling. Sold labels. Show us the lots disappearing. Every single item is sold. George is now with the auctioneer. He's studying the list of items as auction assistants busy themselves around him, carrying and packing the sold lots. The auctioneer, who's putting on his coat, congratulates George. Well done, it's all sold. There's nothing left. George nods, but his smile seems a little ironic. He leaves the room. On the stairway as he's leaving, he is joined by a distinguished-looking man who puts on his coat and leaves. They follow him at the same time. The man crosses the street and we follow him. He gets into a car. Peppy is sitting in the back. She's alone and watching George walk off with his unsteady gait. She is sad. The man casts a glance to ask her what he should do next. Peppy, with a forced smile, motions that they can leave. As the man starts up the motor car, George is walking away. The car sets off and overtakes him. Peppy does not turn around. She is crying. George, dressed differently, is drinking in a clandestine bar that has made the effort of putting up a few Christmas decorations. George is visibly smashed. A small version of him appears superimposed on the bar, dressed as an explorer, 
and discovering the life-sized version of himself. The big version watches the little version load his rifle. The little version shoots at the big version, but the big version just smiles. The little version runs off to get help, and he comes back with a tribe of African warriors, all bearing spears. They attack. The big version tries to defend himself. He staggers as he gets to his feet, trying to gesture to the barman, but he's so drunk that he falls straight backwards without making the slightest attempt to stop his fall. The Africans leap about with joy. George's chauffeur comes into the bar. He motions to the barman, who jerks his head in one direction. The chauffeur follows the indication and finds George lying on the floor, totally smashed. He slaps him gently around the face a few times in vain, attempting to wake him, then lifts him over his shoulder, pays the check, and leaves. At George's house, his chauffeur puts him to bed and hangs his suit carefully before leaving the room. He sees the dog goes over to it, and strokes it. They look at each other. We can tell that the chauffeur is worried about George. Peppy Miller is the guardian angel. On a huge poster, on the facade of a movie theater, George goes inside with Jack. The auditorium is full. George sits down in the first row. To watch the film, he has to look upwards. He sees a huge and magnificent Peppy rising over him. She's playing a scene with a young actor we recognize. It's Humphrey Bogart. He's become a spectator. He laughs, is absorbed, and cries along with the others. Coming out of the theater, several young people bump into him. They don't recognize him. There's a lot of people milling about, so he picks Jack up. A woman exclaims an oh of admiration, as though she's recognized George. He smiles modestly, but soon realizes it's just because she thinks Jack is cute. She has come over to stroke him, like she would any other dog. She is totally under Jack's charm and says to George, If only he could talk. George still has the smile on his lips, but it has become one of resignation. He looks away as the woman strokes the dog. George is playing Zorro. He performs stunt after stunt and close-ups, showing his devastating smile to its best advantage. In fact, it's an extract from The Mark of Zorro with Douglas Fairbanks, into which we will insert shots of John we've shot ourselves. The Zorro sequence is being screened on a wall in George's apartment. George is watching himself, slumped in an easy chair. His sluggish attitude and listless air are in sharp contrast with the image of himself projected by the film. Then the image jumps and goes white. George gets up, still half smashed. His shadow is clearly delineated on the white screen. He sees it, looks it up and down, and then starts to look at it sideways. Look at what you've become. He carries on shouting at it obviously very annoyed with it. You're very nasty, and stupid, and arrogant. He doesn't even want to look at it anymore. He looks disgusted. Suddenly, his shadow separates itself from him and moves independently. As he shouts at it, it lowers its head and doesn't reply. You acted very badly. You were thoughtless. He carries on as though it's normal, until his shadow walks off with its head bowed. He watches it go, trying to understand what's happening. It's gone, and he's still there. He begins to holler. Come back! Come back here right now! Totally smashed, he starts to violently throw film reels against the wall as he hollers. The cans split open, and the film bursts out all over. George is becoming more and more frenzied. The floor is now covered in cans and film. He stops dripping with sweat. Worriedly, he looks around for a moment. Then, he strikes a match, taking a second to consider what he's about to do, and throws the match into the middle of the reels. There's madness in his eyes as he watches the fire take hold. We can see his pleasure at seeing the flames spread, 
but he's very quickly overrun. The reels burst into flame in an instant and give off lots of smoke. Jack is panicking and barks incessantly. Suddenly, George seems to lose it. He doesn't know what to do anymore, and although the fire is spreading quite spectacularly around him, he runs to where the reels and films that he has not opened are, and begins throwing them frantically over his shoulder, as though he's looking for one in particular. The ever-increasing denseness of the smoke, however, is making the task almost impossible. On the floor below the smoke, Jack flees the room and runs off while George suffocates, but continues to struggle with the cans of reels. The dog comes out of the house and makes a dash for the sidewalk as fast as he can. In the room, among the flames and the smoke, George, now breathless, picks up one of the reels and tries to turn around. He collapses, still holding on to the can. Jack spots a cop at a junction. He takes hold of the cop's trouser leg with his teeth and tries to pull him towards George's house. The policeman doesn't understand and pushes it away with his foot. The dog persists and barks, but the cop just wants to be left in peace. George is now suffocating on the floor. The level of smoke is getting ever lower and is slowly covering his face. Jack barks louder and louder. The policeman feels uncomfortable. A woman is watching the scene inquisitively. Not knowing what to do, the cop motions to the dog to be silent and threatens it with two fingers, just like George miming a pistol. Jack collapses and plays dead. The cop has no idea what's happened. He crouches down and touches the dog to see if it's all right. Jack wakes up and goes to leave, but stops immediately to show the cop he wants to take him with him. The cop still doesn't understand. It's the woman who tells him what he must do. The cop seems to understand, has a moment of doubt, and then starts following the dog. Jack encourages him to go faster, but the cop resists to begin with. Little by little, realizing the seriousness of the situation, he speeds up more and more until he finally arrives flat out at George's home. The cop sees the smoke coming out of the house. He runs in. A completely unconscious George, overcome by the fumes, is dragged out of the fire by the policeman. They come out of the house. George is still clutching the reel. A crowd has formed, people recognizing him. One woman feels sorry for him. A man runs for help. George is unconscious. We see Peppy on a chute, sitting in a chair with her name on it, smoking a cigarette. Everyone about her is busy preparing a shot. Suddenly, an assistant brings her a telephone. She takes the receiver with a smile and listens. Her expression tightens a little. She hangs up, pensive for a moment. On set, the director gestures to his assistant that the shot is ready and they are good to go. The assistant goes toward Peppy to tell her now, but... As he gets to where she should be, her seat is empty. He looks everywhere for her, but she has disappeared. In her car, still in costume, she urges her chauffeur to go as quick as he can. The car pulls into the hospital courtyard. Peppy bursts into the lobby, talks to a woman at the desk, who directs her with a raised hand that Peppy immediately follows. She bounds up the stairs, four at a time, and comes into a corridor. Then to a door and through a window, she sees George lying down. His dog is at the foot of his bed, asleep. George is on a drip, unconscious and covered in bandages. A doctor is in the room with a nurse. Peppy enters. She's anxious, but the doctor seems reassuring. He's not in any danger now. He just needs to rest. Peppy goes up to George. She notices that his burnt hands seem to be clutching something. She's intrigued. In response, the doctor shows the reel of her film that sits in the corner of the room. He was holding that. It was really hard to pry it away from him. Peppy picks up the can. The label is too damaged to be able to read the front title of the film. She opens it and unrolls some of the film in front of the window. We see random photograms run by. It's the only sequence they ever shot together, years before. Peppy is moved. Without turning around, she asks the doctor, 
Do you think he could come rest at my place? The doctor nods, with a kindly glint in his eye. It's probably the very best he could have hoped for. An ambulance takes George, still unconscious, to Peppy's house. Jack is with him. It's a large, beautiful house, very expensive, and very Hollywood, but it's also very inviting. It's nighttime. George is in bed. He opens one eye. Then he wakes up and looks around, not understanding where he is. Jack wakes up and barks and wags his tail. A nurse, who has been dozing in an armchair, facing the bed, awakes with a start, and then goes over to George. She reassures him, motions to him not to get upset, and then slowly leaves the room before running off down the corridor. She knocks at a door, and then goes back to George's room. Peppy is close on her heels. She comes into the room in her nightgown. When he sees her, George smiles, and she rushes over to the bed puts her arms tight around him. She is terribly moved, but when she releases him from her arms to talk to him, she realizes that he has lost consciousness again, and so was not sharing the same special moment as she. She pulls a face, afraid she might have done something wrong, glances over at the nurse, and then lays George's head back on his pillow. The next morning, Peppy brings breakfast into George's room, and they eat it together. She laughs, talks, eats, drinks, and is as vivacious as she had dreamed she would be all those years before. He looks at her with a smile on his face. Then she looks at her watch and realizes she needs to hurry. I've got to go. I have to be on set for nine o'clock. George smiles kindly at her. She returns the smile, but we can tell that maybe reality has just reminded them that she is working and he is not. They exchange a last glance before she leaves the room. George, now alone, gets up with some difficulty. He picks up a pile of folded clothes from an armchair. It's his jacket and pants, both half-burned. On the floor, his shoes are in exactly the same state of disrepair. A little later and alone, George is exploring the house. It's a richly and tastefully decorated, highly personal one. He goes along a corridor and down a wide stairway. He begins sniffing outside of one door, as though he wants to go inside. George opens the door and goes into the room. It's a kind of storeroom in which everything is covered up with sheets. He closes the door behind him. The room has a ghostly quality to it. Jack sniffs about everywhere. George, too, seems troubled by the strange pervading atmosphere. His curiosity is spurred by a convoluted object that is covered in a thin cloth. A ray of light surges into the room. The door has opened. Standing against the daylight is a maid. You should go back to your room, sir. George nods with a smile. The maid leaves pretty swiftly. We haven't seen her face. The whole moment seemed rather strange. George is intrigued but leaves the room. He has to call Jack to him. Jack is reluctant to go, but finally obeys his master. A screenplay lies on a table. Peppy and Zimmer are seated either side of the table and are talking animatedly. We are on the set we saw the previous day. Peppy seems to be trying to convince Zimmer of something. She seems to be describing a film poster or the facade of a movie theater she'd love to see. He doesn't seem too enthusiastic from the looks of the negative shakes of his head, in his apologetic air as he listens to Peppy. She finally stops talking and gives him a determined look. Zimmer, uncomfortable and sorry, calmly replies. George is a silent movie actor. He belongs to the past. Today, he's a nobody. As Zimmer is speaking, she removes her accessories and hat. Zimmer is so intrigued, he stops talking. What are you doing? She looks him straight in the eyes and answers, I'm stopping work. It's him or me. She looks determined. He's looking unsure of himself. He visibly isn't sure if he's understood properly. She drives her point home. What I mean is, it's either him and me, or neither of us. Zimmer isn't sure he has understood. He just looks at her. I'm blackmailing you, get it? Even when she's blackmailing, she's still pretty, and Zimmer looks at her totally at a loss. At the same time, it's obvious that he's going to back down. 
The people around them are listening in on the conversation and seem to be waiting for his decision. There is an element of deja vu to the situation, and Zimmer, who already backed down a few years before, gives in. And why not? She smiles at him, picks up the screenplay with delight, and leaves. As she moves away, she whistles at him. He turns around. She vigorously blows him a kiss. The screenplay lies on the front seat of the car. The camera pulls back. It's Clifton who is in the driving seat. George is lying in bed when his former chauffeur comes in. At first, he's delighted to see him, but this turns into astonishment, and he seems to ask the man a question. The chauffeur answers, I work for Miss Miller now. George visibly doesn't know what to think, and, although he remains pleasant, becomes somewhat reserved. It's as though something has come between them. The chauffeur places the screenplay on the bedside table. George seems to greet it with mistrust, certainly not with enthusiasm. The chauffeur also has a box of cakes with him that he puts on a plate for George. George doesn't want any. It's all too much. Before he leaves, the chauffeur overcomes his habitual reserve for the first time and says to George, She's been good to you. She's always looked out for you. The chauffeur leaves without trying to convince George further, as the others look on full of pride and doubt. From the window, we see the chauffeur get into the car and drive off. We recognize the car as being the one that belonged to George. At the window, George watches him leave. Then he seems to have an idea, more exactly, an intuition. George goes into the room that's full of sheets. He goes straight over to the object with a bizarre shape and lifts the sheet. Underneath, he finds his former objet d'art, the three monkeys, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. He thinks for a moment and pulls off another sheet to reveal a piece of furniture. Once again, it's a piece that used to belong to him. We recognize it from having seen it at the auction room. After taking off several other sheets, George realizes that she bought everything he had up for sale. Furniture, paintings, objet d'art, souvenir, etc. He rips off sheets one after the other and objects appear, even down to his suits and tuxedos. He continues and discovers the painting, depicting him in a tux, waving and smiling. George is so stunned at the sight of himself, looking so full of life. He is interrupted by the same ray of light which surges into the room once more. This time, at the door, are the butler and the maid. George walks toward them when he sees them. The closer he gets to them, the more his expression tightens. We realize that the butler has none other than the distinguished-looking man who purchased everything at the auction. The maid is the woman who is betting against him to raise the sale price. George is looking at them as he leaves the room. He has recognized them, but doesn't say anything to them. He walks off, still shocked by what he's just realized. He finishes putting on his burnt suit in his room and leaves. He goes down the stairs and flees the house. George is in the street wearing his burnt suit and damaged shoes. He is shirtless. With Jack by his side, he walks along the sidewalk. There are a few other people walking along. About twenty yards ahead of him, a man is begging. He holds out his hand to pass her by. George approaches. When there are no other passers between him and George, the beggar glances at him and lowers his hand. He doesn't raise it as George approaches. George stops in front of him and looks at him, but the beggar motions for him to scram. George continues on his way. For that moment at least, he has become one of them. George buttons up the collar of his suit in an attempt to hide the fact that he doesn't have a shirt. Then, he heads off and loses himself in the crowd. Some distance later, he stops to check his reflection in a shop window. The image he sees is that of a bum. It's even more striking, because in the window, there is a young male mannequin wearing a tux, top hat, and white scarf. The image of the mannequin and George are superimposed. A cop comes up to George and begins talking to him in a friendly manner. He speaks, but we don't know what about. There is no title card. George visibly has no idea what the cop is talking about. The cop seems to be talking about nothing important, just chatting. 
He talks and talks. George doesn't understand what he's saying and doesn't understand why he's talking to him. He's lost. What did you say? The cop smiles, carrying on talking, and then stops. He thinks he's talking to a madman. He doesn't persist. He merely sizes George up, and once he's decided that he's harmless, the cop walks off. George is totally bewildered by the incident. He seems to lose his grip on himself a little more. Peppy gets home in the evening, arms laden with flowers. She's happy. She quickly goes up the stairs into George's bedroom. He's not there. She looks for him, but can't find him. The maid says that he is left. She drops the flowers. George goes into his house that has been disfigured by the fire. The flames have changed everything, and the atmosphere seems ghostly and sad. George sits down in an armchair in the darkness. Jack sits down facing him. He wags his tail, and it thumps on the ground. In the room with all the sheets, Peppy is with the maid. The maid seems to be telling her what happened with George, how he removed all the sheets, etc. Peppy listens with an inscrutable expression on her face. Then, suddenly overcome by a terrible thought, she rushes outside. She runs out of the house and over to the car, but the chauffeur isn't there. She honks the horn to call him, but there's no response. She honks the horn again, then, not wanting to wait any longer, Seeing the keys on the dashboard, she gets behind the wheel, starts the engine, and pulls off in a series of kangaroo hops. It's obvious that she doesn't know how to drive that well, but still goes at full speed, more or less successful. Just as she passes through the gate, the chauffeur turns up, but too late. He sees her drive away. Peppy is driving as fast as she can through town, but she's pretty reckless and almost causes an accident. Outside George's house... The wind is slamming one of the shutters with the regularity of a metronome. George takes a gulp of liquor, then puts down the glass, opens a cardboard box, and takes out a pistol. He places it on the table in front of him, picks up the glass for another gulp. Jack doesn't like what he sees and barks. As for Peppy, she's speeding along, totally ignoring even the most basic of road safety requirements. George puts down his glass and picks up the pistol. Jack isn't happy at all. He barks and bites George's trouser leg, pulling on it. Peppy is speeding along. George puts the pistol into his mouth. Jack is barking like mad. George, still in the same position, closes his eyes. Bang! George is in the same position. He still has the pistol in his mouth. Visibly, he has heard the bang from outside because he takes the pistol out of his mouth and looks out the window. Outside, we see Peppy's car has rammed into the gate and is still shuddering. Peppy didn't break in time, but she doesn't care. She jumps out of the car and runs into the house. She rushes into the living room and stops for a moment to look at George. George awkwardly tries to hide the pistol behind him. She bursts into tears. I feel so awful. I only wanted to help you. To take care of you. He seems to reply that no, it's not her fault. She's nothing to feel bad about. He opens his arms towards her, still holding the pistol. The gun fires itself. Fortunately, no one is hurt, but the incident makes Peppy laugh. Between sobs and gasps of laughter, she throws herself into George's arms. They hug for a long time. Peppy says into his ear, You've got so much that no one else has. And into her ear, George replies, No, I'm nothing but a shadow. No good for anything but silence. Peppy doesn't reply. She just holds him tighter still and closes her eyes. Jack is sitting close by, watching them and wagging his tail. Outside, the shutter is still slamming and the car is still shuddering. Peppy opens her eyes. Visibly, she has an idea. Jack wags his tail and thumps it on the ground. The shutter slams. The car shudders. Peppy smiles at George. I know what you have that no one else does. Peppy moves away from George and motions to him to listen. The shutter slams. Jack's tail thumps. The car shudders. Peppy does a few tap steps. George doesn't understand. Peppy starts again with a beaming smile, waiting for his response. 
George does a few taps himself, basic ones, without any great enthusiasm. She smiles at him and does a few more complex steps that are a lot livelier. He smiles back, finally understanding the golden gift that he has in his feet. He looks at Peppy lovingly, with a beaming smile on his face. At Kynograph Studios, music suddenly begins to play, and we see feet dancing in another decor. Except from now on, we actually hear the sound of the tap steps. We pull back to find Peppy and George in Zimmer's office. They're dancing for him. Little by little, Zimmer is convinced by them. When they finish their demonstration, he has a broad smile on his face. We find Peppy and George on a film set, still dancing. The piece of jazz they are dancing to has gone so crazy that now everyone wants to get up and dance. They are dancing a tap, facing the camera, in a decor representing a stylized New York. The choreography is incredible, in the grand style of the old Hollywood musicals. They finish with a knee slide that brings them right up to us with big smiles on their faces. The music stops on a powerful blast from the brass instruments that leaves everyone bursting with energy. In the ensuing silence, Peppy and George stay exactly where they were, facing the camera, with the smile stuck on their faces. It goes on for a little too long. They are out of breath. Then they look at someone off shot. They are facing a film crew, in their era, of course. The director smiles. Zimmer, sitting next to him, seems ecstatic. The director speaks, and we hear what he says. Cut! Excellent! Zimmer has both his thumbs up. The director says to Peppy and George, One more, please? George laughs and replies. We hear him, too. With pleasure. The credits run while Peppy and George go back to their positions. The camera, ours, pulls back and into frame come all the technicians who are setting up the shot, the hair, makeup, and costume people for continuity. The camera comes into position, the director coming over to say a few words to the star couple. In short, the shot is being prepared for another take, and when everyone is in position, the director speaks into his megaphone and we hear, Okay, camera, sound, rolling, and action. We fade to black, and the music picks up again for the end of the credit sequence. Okay guys, that's all for today. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell to receive notifications when I release a new movie reading. Comment below if you'd like a specific movie reading. I have so many movie readings that I want to get to in the future, and I will try to get to all of the comments eventually. Thanks for listening again, and see you in the next movie reading.